Hello and welcome to the Old Man Orange Podcast. I'm Spencer Scott Holmes, bringing you another Old Man Orange Presents via VHS episode. One of them from the rarities vault that we have from back in the day that just never got put out. So come join us for another fun-filled retro movie review. Let's jump on in. So welcome to another episode of the Via VHS Retro Movie Podcast. I'm your host, Wesley. Joined as always by Spencer Scott Holmes. And um, we're going back to the 70s. This week, the uh, rare trip that we make back into the late seventies and the very early stages, the genesis of the VHS era, and um, we have deemed that appropriate. And we're going to look back at a cold classic, a film that Quentin Tarantino uh, adores, considers one of his favorite of all time, and um, one I had never seen. Um, what I'm assuming you you've seen this. I did, but what I uh, learned this one from, and here's my little Blu-ray right here, mm-hmm. is I, I got that Tarantino book, Cinema Speculation or whatnot. Yeah, I need to read through it. Through there. And the cool thing was I felt is when I went that book, I'm like, I've actually seen like 95% of the movies in there. So it made me feel good. Like I, like I, like I, I did my civic duty throughout life. But there was two of them. It's like Running Thunder, which I always knew about. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that one just sounds so amazing. I'm like, you know what? I got, I'm just going to go out and buy the Blu-ray. I got to see this. And then I watched it maybe, I don't know, six months ago or something like that. And the first thing I thought was like, oh, dude, we got to do a podcast on this. This movie is so good. So good. You know? And then there was actually one other one that Cinema Speculation. There's one called Joe that has, um, oh, geez, what's the dude from uh, Everybody Loves Brayman, the dad. Um, okay, I know you're talking about. I can't think of his name though. Young Frankenstein is the yes. creature. God, what um, is his name? Go ahead, continue. I'll, I'll find well, it. It's pretty much where he's just this old kind it's of like right conservative guy. Of course. And yeah, there's another guy whose daughter's just you know a hippie and everything like that, and it's played by Susan Sarandon, who's the daughter and whatnot. And she's oh. going out of control with you know uh, her hippie boyfriend and whatnot like that. And so the old conservative guy at the bar, who's kind of you know a little racist, a little bit that hates everything, and so on. Tells him, like, well, let's go out. We're going to go on a shooting spree and just take care of these hippies. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, sounds legit. I mean, oh, Peter Boyle. Peter Boyle. There we go. There we go. Yeah, God damn it. I was, it was driving me nuts. I was so close. I was like, Danny Boyle? I'm like, no, that's, that's, no, that's not him. That's the <laughs> I know who that is. Yeah. Um, well, Tarantino, so this was like the first movie he ever saw in cinemas when he was like five. Oh, really? Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> he had an interesting upbringing, I think. I think he had a very, very interesting uh, yeah, I think time of it. We're all the better for it. Though. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's a perfect example of like why you should take your kids to go see rated R movies. <laughs> you, you might get a Tarantino out of it. I think that's the moral of our podcast. I think that's, you know, <laughs> take your kids to see the nastiest, dirtiest, raunchiest shit you can. And if they survive that, then they'll be champions. Well, I always think about it because, you know, like growing up, you know, there's the kids, there's those kids that like can't see radar movies whatsoever. I'm talking about like once you're at like 10 years old or something like that. But then I always think of like any of the people, any of my buddies that I knew that were like allowed to watch radar movies since like the dawn of time, they always turned out super nice, super friendly and everything like that. And a lot of times the kids that were denied rated R movies, like way up to like their teens and everything like that. Started to get into all kinds of trouble and mischief and stuff followed afterwards. Like, you know, mm. it felt like there is, there's something to be said about being like, you know, it's not that you have to be like, hey, Billy, you're six years old. Here's a clockwork orange. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> you know, well. There's certain movies that might set up uh, not the greatest place. But if one of those ones, if, if they gravitated towards like they wanted to see The Predator, well, let them see The Predator. Just yeah. let, them, let them sort of pick it out, you know what I mean? Yeah, I have to keep my oldest, who's just turned five, Mm-hmm. I have to keep him away from stuff like that because he wants to. I was watching something on YouTube one time, and then somehow the algorithm said, you know what you should watch is that opening scene from It, the most recent It, <laughs> and where the kid gets his arm bit off, you know, like the, yeah. the opening of scene. And so I had left the room for a second. A second I was with my youngest Just in another room. Dang. Yeah, and so he had switched that, and I come back in there, and he's like, eyes are like this. I'm like, what are you watching? And it's like the kid's about to get his arm bit off. I'm like, well, I can't change it now. So I have to like wait. I have to wait thirty seconds. I mean, he he deserves the payoff at this point. And so I let him watch and that, that. That's when you pause it and you have like a GI Joe PSA right there. And that's why we don't play next to like the you know the water drains. Yeah. Well, honestly, <laughs> like I tried to. I was like, okay, well, I mean, we're we're deep into this now. Like, there's nothing I could do. So I let him watch that part, and I'm like, okay, I'm turning it off. He goes, no. 
I want to watch the rest. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, you don't. He's a spooky kid. He likes all the the dark stuff. Uh huh. Halloween's his favorite holiday. He watches Halloween stuff right. We're in June. Yeah. Right now, and he he's like, I'm I'm ready for Halloween. So. Yeah, that's logical. Yeah. He's my spooky kid. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. But this one, you know, this is uh, one I've heard about for a long, long time. I've always wanted to watch it, um, mainly because, it, you know, Tommy Lee Jones. I mean, if he's in something, I'm usually pretty interested in it. Um, except for what was that one where he's with the, in the house with the cheerleaders? Other than that. Yeah, so I, don't, I don't know what that one is. Ian. Yeah, I can't remember what it was. I think it was a cheerleader. I think it was like a tech. I don't know what it was. It was but, one of those ones because Tommy Lee Jones, like in the '80s, was always like the abusive guy in a lot of films. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like in uh, uh, Coal Miner's Daughter. Yeah, you know, and then there's also the one that it sticks in my mind all the time. Oh. His death scene in it, but uh, in um, Heaven and Hell, the one where he comes back from Vietnam and the Oliver Stone like Vietnam trilogy. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, when he's dying, why is he naked in the truck? Like, I just always wonder, like, what, what was the point? Like, let's just see. You know what? Let's put him naked in the truck. He should just be <sighs> naked in there. I know he's he's dead now, but for some reason he also had the urge to rip off all his clothes and sit in this truck ass naked. Yeah, well, that's Tommy Lee Jones. He can do what he wants. <laughs> exactly. And uh, I mean, obviously, Fugitive is what I think of first. Yeah. Um, and then that masterpiece that is Volcano. Oh, that's a fantastic film. Oh God, no, it's not. <laughs> I can't. Like Dante's Peak will agree. Like I agree. Yeah, like Dante's Peak is oh man, Volcano. It sounds weird. Oh. I haven't probably seen Volcano since the '90s, but I remember I used to watch it quite often because it used to always be on TV. And it, I mean, probably just the, the disasterness of it. And who knows? Yeah. Maybe it's not that great anymore. So maybe we have no. to give it a, a rewind. We should watch that one soon, actually, because we both love Dante's Peak, and I know we will not love that one. But <laughs> um, and Hayes as well, wasn't she in it? Oh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Man, Hayesh, rest in peace. Um, so, yeah, so Rolling Thunder, 1977. Um, cool classic, you know, very influential film, obviously written um, by Paul Schrader. Uh, there you go. Look at that, Back Schrader. On. That Paul Schrader book that's kind of hard to find. Yeah, he looks you know, like a... Bitch. <laughs> yeah, this book doesn't look like you're getting to a film book right here. No, he looks like, like a, a newscaster. Like a tax book or something like that. Yeah, yeah, like he's like Schrader on taxes. <laughs> and um, yeah, so, but yeah, he, he wrote, you know, Taxi Driver wrote a lot of other stuff, directed some movies, uh, American Gigolo, other, all kinds of stuff. He did uh, he, that one that we did uh, not too long ago. Oh yeah, Light of Day. Light of Day. <laughs> yeah, Michael J. Fox, Joan Jett. Weird little film if you've never seen it. I... One of the few films, I think, looking back, um, that we've done, where I genuinely just, at, at the end of the day, just did not like it. <laughs> there was, there's been a few. And that and was I one. Because it feels like it should be so amazing. I think yes. that's, what, that, that's what doubles it up. It's like, why is this not like one of the coolest films you've ever seen? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Spoiler alert, Joan, Jett, Joan Jett's character is trash and not redeemable at all. Not that he doesn't have Paul Schrader doesn't have some other characters that are the same way, but <laughs> yeah. at least it's kind of you, a Paul Schrader thing to have bad characters. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you sympathize with some of them still, you know, because of the circumstances. Yeah. And, um, Joan Jett seems, she just sucked. I mean, she just kind of just sucked in that movie. But, um, yeah, this is, um, I guess it's pretty, pretty much right after taxi driver. And, uh, you know, Paul Schrader has issues with the way this film turned out. Um, which I disagree with. Um, we'll probably get to that in review. Like it just it made no sense to me why he didn't like it. Um, based on what he was saying, but um, you know, obviously Tarantino loves this film. He champions it. He named his releasing company Rolling Thunder for a little bit. It's one that he talks about any chance he gets. We watched a great little snippet on YouTube from Eli Roth where he's kind of setting this thing up, and we were like, "Damn, this is really cool. We need to take notes on this one." <laughs> yeah, yeah. He and uh, dialed yeah. in. Yeah, he does have a dialed in on that one. So, it's a it's a really important film, um, and uh, this is not you know like we recently did like some more fun summer fair. This is not your feel good movie of the summer. <laughs> this is not what this is, you know. Yeah. So, but it <laughs> this is you know it's summertime. You just got back from Vietnam. You've been stuck in a prison camp for ten years. The world's completely changed since you've last been here. Last time you were here, it was like American graffiti. And next thing you know, there's been all these hippies and stuff since then. <laughs> we don't wear bras anymore. <laughs> um, 
um, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, oh gosh, this movie, it is depressing. It's not the feel good movie of the summer unless good movies make you feel good. And for me, that is the case. So, from a mood standpoint, you know, this is our, our fun, light, breezy fare that we usually get into. Um, but this is a damn good movie. So, if you're cool with it, I think what we should do is just go ahead and jump into that rewind review. I think we got to. I think so. Okay, hold on one second. Oh, no, I had to look some other stuff up, so I think I might have... Give me one second. Here we go. <laughs> I did look up the music, the the box office, you know how it is in the 70s. It isn't really... You can't find you it. Know, you I know Star Wars and Smokey the Bandit are out. <laughs> that's what I know. Yeah. So yeah, that's all I saw when I went to box office mode. Yeah, yeah. It's just you know how it is. But I do look at the music, and the number one is very interesting. So, <clears throat> all right. So it feels weird to do with this film because you know we usually are looking at like silly stuff, and um, so we like to go back in time and you know relive when a movie was released and go back to the week it was released and look at some of the pop culture surrounding the film and just kind of a, you know, take us back to a particular time and place. And we're going back to October 7th of 1977. Um, as you know, with box office mojo, um, or any place you get like box office statistics from, uh, this, they really aren't from a weekly standpoint. They're not really, you know, accurate until you get to like the early eighties. So, um, we don't have a box office for this one. All you need to know is Star Wars is out, the original Star Wars, and Smokey and the Bandit, and they're running shit. Okay? Yeah. So nobody's making a whole lot of money on this one. Not that this movie did terrible, but um, and it had a pretty fair critical response. It's even better now than it was, mm-hmm. you know, back then, as people look upon this one really, really fondly. But, um, yeah, so no box office this week. But I will go to the mu- music charts real quick. Um, and I, I wasn't going to do this cause there's some really, it's just kind of like, you know, disco yeah, and like some bad poppy stuff. It's not the part of the seventies that we love. There's some of that stuff in there, but number one was so interesting. I was like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do it. Number one song on the radio. If you're cruising, uh, to see uh, rolling thunder, um, probably late night. This is a late night viewing kind of thing. If you're going by yourself. Um, you know, you're not taking the family. This is just, you know, you're kind of, you're probably a CD individual, honestly, let's just be real. Um, and so you probably didn't listen to this on the radio, but if you were number one is, uh, the star Wars theme cantina band by Mako, the disco kind of like mix up the version disco variation. Of I, I, yes. I like that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's number one. That shows you, if, if anything needs to tell you how big star Wars was culturally, like how much of a phenomenon it was. That's it. That number one, here we are in October. Mm-hmm. And the number one song is the Star Wars theme slash Cantina Band remix kind of disco version. So pretty interesting. Um, so it's number one. Uh, I'll just breeze through some of these. Keep it coming. Love. Casey and Sunshine Band. The 70s were just so horny. Yeah, like they they were just, it was so like, and it was like, um, it wasn't like young teenager horny it was like like the 90s were like it was like oh, kind of middle-aged you know you know what's that rupert holmes song the pina colada song where it's like the oh, married yeah. couple kind of that's 70s horny okay yeah that, that's it it's like you know we've been together forever but uh, i decided to kind of just take a look at you know at the one ads and see who else there was and hey lo and behold it was my wife again yeah yeah lo and behold. she was doing the same thing too yeah we tried Fucking horror. <laughs> <laughs> anyway you want to go get some pina coladas um so yeah it's yeah fuck a bitch anyway keep it coming love casey and the sunshine band um you know what you light up my life this is what debbie boone says uh oh, yeah. number three. <laughs> oh god it's bad uh nobody does it better carly simon oh, that's a good uh, double that is, song. yes it is yeah that one's good that's rock and roll by sean cassidy best of my love the emotions so not the bg's version i mean not the eagles version yeah um oh, it's probably not even the same song but boogie nights heat wave cold as ice by foreigner that was okay yeah uh, the, although foreigner does have my least favorite song maybe of all time 
Which song? Jukebox Hero. Oh, I Jukebox, fucking, yeah. I hate that song. Uh, you know, I I'm hate not, that I, song. Foreigner's one of those bands to me. I look at them. I'm not the biggest fan. I call them sort of, they're the generic rock band of the 70s is 100% what they are. They're just like Journey, but not good. Yeah, but not, yeah, not as good as Journey. <laughs> Journey no. slaps. I fucking love Journey. Yeah, I love Journey. Yeah, Foreigner's just that one where it's just like, I feel like, you know, you if you have to put up with them being there, like at a concert, like I did see them once, they opened up for like Sticks and uh, Def Leppard. I think, I think I remember you telling me about that. You know, I mean? it's not like they played bad or anything like that, but you know, it's just one of those ones that I always feel like they're, they're kind of like the generic rock of the, there's just generic radio rock of the 70s. Yeah. Is what Foreigner is. Yeah, I agree. Um, running out of your top 10, you have Brick House by the Commodores. Ow, oh, she's a brick. Brick. <laughs> oh man, that was one of my, my mom loved that song. <laughs> Singing all the time. I just want to be your everything, Andy Gibb. And then that's pretty much your general fare all the way through this. I feel loved on a summer. Do you have telephone line, electric light orchestra? You know, just uh, Crystal Gales on here, Barry White. Yeah, but um, very little rock songs, it sounds like. It seems like this, this is the yeah. time here where rock has started to fall off the face of the earth. Number 30, though, and it's rising in the charts because <laughs> yeah. people are like disco, 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 cheesy, sappy pop, all this stuff. And then and then Mr. Ted Nugent comes along and says, you know what? I got cat scratch fever. Oh, there we go. Good. I got Good. cat Uncle Ted scratch. Right here. Uncle Ted says, you know what? You know, make a pearl with a stroke of my hand is what he says. And exactly. He does. And then you go next one is Little River Band. Which was another <laughs> one. The mom, my mom had like <laughs> when we were <laughs> the movie The Other Guys. When he always has a LRB, so I have LRB on deck all the time. That was my mom actually. <laughs> she she had like LRB's greatest hits, and she had another Little River Band thing, and she played um, those songs like crazy. Like she played good stuff too, but like it was like um um. You know, we'd be going the car in the car to school with me and my brother and sister. Would be Friday night, it was late. I was walking you home. We got down to the gate, and I was dreaming of the night. <laughs> like we knew all the words of that shit. Like, oh my gosh, so little river band. But um, so so, so uh, Rolling Thunder. Mm-hmm. Um, nineteen. 19- got a great intro song. It doesn't. You didn't like that song. I, I didn't like it. I, I didn't. Like that song. I, I did not I like that it. That folksy. Kind of like, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of, a, I, I like some of those weird folk music from like the 70s. Yeah, I like some of it too. I just felt like, even at the beginning, you know, I didn't really know what, I, I didn't know what this movie was about. So let me start there. I did not know what this movie was about at all. And you're going to make fun of me. I honestly thought it was about a trucker. <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> it should be with the Rolling Thunder. I mean, I, 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 that's what I thought it was about you because there's. Yeah, go ahead. I think that's one of the best ways to go into a movie is knowing absolutely nothing what it's yeah. about. Just knowing, like, I just want to see this. This sounds interesting. Like, the, yeah. the, the cover looks, you know, I think that's one of the best ways because you're so surprised when you go through a movie. You know, if you read the back of a box, sometimes that almost spoils too much for you. Yeah. You know, there's something so nice about going into something extremely fresh. Yeah. I, I knew there was a hook involved. Mm. And I knew that there was some, some bloody shit happened in there. So I just assumed it was like convoy but like they fuck shit up (laughs) that's kind of what i was thinking this movie was gonna be it's so funny looking back now i'm like but also rolling thunder why is it called that yeah well there's there's that operation rolling thunder in vietnam i think that's where that title comes i guess so it must that that makes sense okay at least we so we got some insight here because i was like why they call it this i thought this was about (laughs) truckers you know well well, i'm I'm pleasantly surprised it wasn't I, I'm going to say this about your trucker thing. Well, uh, you know, you'd be like Paul Schrader didn't like the opening song in the movie either because in his version, he's got this old country one, which I went to go track down because I couldn't find it on Spotify, but I found somebody uploaded on YouTube. Uh-huh. And then I went down the rabbit hole of this guy and um, I'm trying to blank on his name right now, but it's in the, it's in the original script, which I, I actually have, and I've always kind of wanted to sit through and read. But um, it's those old story time, like 50s country songs. So it would yeah. have gave a very trucker vibe feeling in, with that kind of intro. That would have been better. I mean, the opening song is one of the few things I didn't like about this movie, just because I'm like, what is this? It was kind of sappy. It was kind of like, I don't know. But I mean, I'm going to add it to um, the Via VHS playlist on Spotify, which shameless plug. I just started that. So nice. all the movies that we review, review, I don't know if you saw that. I sent it to you, but all the movies that we review, 
yeah, I've putting taken songs from it and putting it onto a playlist. So I've already kind of backtracked and did all the previous episodes, so you can go listen to stuff. That so you got like Light of Day on there, and you got... yeah, yeah, I got Light of Day. I got um, I'll look at it here in a, at the end of the episode. I'll kind of give you an update on it. Sure. But um, yeah, that was one of the few things about the song I didn't like. Uh, real quick, let me go down here to the soundtrack and just see. Oh, San Antonio, written yeah, by Santa Barry Tone. DeVorzon, uncredited. So I don't know if I'll be adding that to the playlist or not, because I don't know if I'll be able to find it. But yeah, if it's, it's on Spotify, on, it'll it'll, be there. it's on Spotify I see it because I've listened to it a few times, I think. I believe so, at least. Well, there you go. Maybe I listed it on YouTube. I don't know. But I found yeah. the, the other trucker one where I was just like, you know, it literally in Paul Schrader's script, he literally puts all the lyrics in there like, play the whole damn song. <laughs> I mean, they should have, you know, you're talking about the alternate song. Yeah, the, the, because, you know, because that's the thing about the script thing is he's like, there's the Paul Schrader script, and then there's this one. And even in Tarantino's book, he goes, he's like, it's one of those few times where it's like the script, the original script's amazing, but the alternative script, which is the movie one, is also just as amazing, but in different ways. And he's like, mm -hmm. and I, he's like I get it. Paul Schrader gets a little bit angry about uh, the script being changed. He's like, believe me, I know Oliver Stone fucking cocksucker. It's like, it's like he stops for a second just to really like be like, yeah, let me let me point out who really messed up my script. Jeez. Oh, man. Hey. Don't be wrong. I, I love the Natural Born Killers Oliver Stone version. I've always wanted to sit down and read what the Tarantino version would be like to see if it's uh, is, how different it is. Be better. It'd be better. I don't, you know my feelings about all the rest of Yeah, yeah. You know my my beef. I, I mean, I've I've softened that over the past few years. I really have. I've softened that because I've <laughs> become so much so much conspiratorial lately that I'm like maybe maybe he's on to something. Um, a recently returned Vietnam POW loses his family and his right hand during a violent home invasion and seeks retribution against those responsible. Um. I mean, it's a good synopsis, but there's so it's so much deeper than that. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's not it's it's a, one of those Vietnam Return for Vietnam movies that they had in the seventies, and it's um there's a this movie has a lot to say. It it did slightly remind me of the Joker movie, where it had a lot to say, and it it doesn't say all the things like it starts to like, there's a message, but it doesn't really fully flushes out what that message is sometimes, but it doesn't, this is a much better film than that. I yeah. this is a really, really good movie. And, um, I, I don't all completely understand what everything is supposed to say. Um, but I do understand and sympathize with the main character. Um, and that, you know, that was, that was what this movie really just, you know, what brings this movie home is because the stoic, stoic, you know, what's his name? Charles, William, uh, Devane. William Devane. Yeah. Um, his, his performance in this is really, really, really good. And that's kind of what drives it home. And of course, Tommy Lee Jones, I wish there was a little bit more of him too, but yeah, I mean, damn, this is, yeah, a, yeah. this is a solid movie. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's this movie. It's like I've watched it about three times since uh, initially learning about it. And every single time I like it even more, but I do. I just think it's like I think it's like a perfect film. Like it's one of those ones. Like I had like so little to complain about, but even like the pacing in it. Because I know Eli Roth mentions this in there. Like he's like, well, you know, when I was a kid, I just I never liked those movies where like there's action for like a moment and then there's like, you know, an hours plus of like you know dialogue and then it gets back to action again at the very end. But um, this one works because I feel like all the in betweens when there is an action, so on like that, they're all great scenes. Like I just like the whole experience of it of just like they come back from vietnam they've been pow's for sounds like over 10 years they never exactly explain it but like, i think it, i think it's seven years was that all it is mm -hmm. which is long enough get back in there like, like the only reason <laughs> i thought that is because well i think this because the movie comes out in 77 but i think the script was written like 74 or 75 so it's so that would probably make more logical sense for the seven years then yeah but still, I mean, that's a long ass time. And, um, you know, he's in going through that John McCain shit. And, um, I mean, that's just, it's just tough to think about anyway. I think what makes this movie, um, great 
one of the things I love about it is because it's so sad, it's so depressing, and it brings you down. But you just want this guy to be like, you know, fuck the world. I'm, you know, I'm I'm coming after you. And I'm going to, you know, take my vengeance on somebody after all the shit that y'all put me through this whole world shit on me for all this time. I'm getting somebody back like somebody's getting it. So you root for him, but you also feel like, oh, my God, this is so depressing and sad. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough it's a tough watch. It's funny. There's movies like this. It sounds weird with like. I would show it to some people and they would be like, oh my gosh, that movie's kind of so depressing and everything like that. And weirdly enough, I walk away at the end of the day with a smile on my face, like yeah. in a bizarre kind of way. Like I feel, especially with just how the ending is and everything like that. But it's the same way that I always felt about like The Wrestler, you mm. know, um, the Mickey Rourke movie. Because that movie's like one of those ones, I remember showing that to somebody else and like, you watched this how many times? Like, this is depressing as all can be. I'm like, yeah, I watched it like eight times in the first month it came out. Like, I don't know what it is. And like, it, it oddly puts a smile on my face at the, the yeah. end of the day. Like, it's weird. There's just certain movies like that where it's like, there was no one. It's like Out of the Furnace, which like I just thought was like hilarious. Yes. But some people say the movie like, dude, that thing is just dark as all can be. Yeah, I mean, well, it's just, you know, enjoying watching a good movie. Like, yeah, like, yeah the subject matter was pretty dark and depressing, but it's still, you know, um, it was really damn good. So it puts you in a good mood. You, you just watch this hidden gem, basically, that you could share with other people. And it's like, oh, God, I could, I've could. i added another great movie to the collection of movies I've watched. And so it's good that way. And we going to the review with this part, obviously, there's going to be spoilers if you've never seen this, because I know this is a movie maybe a lot of people haven't seen yeah, um, and would want to. So. There's going to be spoilers going forward, but also we try not to go through the whole plot, but you do have to set this one up to kind of make sense because like, even when I read the synopsis, I'm like, yeah, there's way more to it than that. So um, we're going to get into that. Hold on one second. It'll be just a second. Okay. Oh, I, I couldn't tell if your screen froze. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> I yeah, I, I don't know why. I just paused. <laughs> Like, did you hold, like you put me, on, you hold like your you put me on applause. <laughs> that was like what it felt like. <laughs> I'll be right back. It probably didn't pick up much of it, but I just heard it once, once we took a slight break. I forgot about the subwoofer part. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. Sorry, I was congested. I couldn't oh, no breathe. Worries. I hate when that happens. But you know, what was funny is <clears throat> my kids took a bath earlier and I usually let the water out, but I forgot to, but they had taken a vapor bath. So when I walked in there, it hit me. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, I just kind of want to stay. I might sleep in that room tonight. I might sleep in the bathroom yeah. tonight. Fuck it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but it did. It, that was kind of nice. But Kylie, I'm just like so damn congested still. Yeah. Yeah, nothing's worse than that. Yeah, I don't feel bad. It's just, just that. Okay, so we were talking. So we were talking about. I was going to go through the the um, plot. So uh, I'll go through the directors and actors and stuff, and then we'll you'll kind of talk about what happens in the movie. Um, so yeah, Rolling Thunder, um, director John Flynn. Um, I've obviously written by Paul Schrader. And then uh, William Devane plays Major Charles Rain. You have Ch Tommy Lee Jones playing uh, Johnny Voden, I think is how you pronounce it. Linda Haynes playing Linda Fortune. Uh, James Best, this Roscoe P. Coltrane in here. Yep. It's Texan. Yeah, Roscoe action. Mm -hmm. uh, very small, brief moment. You see Dabney Coleman in here. Yeah. Um, but rest in peace, he died like three weeks ago. Oh, that's um, right. So. Yeah, May 16th. So he it was just, you know, not even a month ago he passed away. Um, Lisa Blake Richards, Lucas Q, um, plays Automatic Slim, which is such a cool name. 
and um, a bunch of other kind of semi-recognizable stars, you know. Um, yeah, so basically, um, as it says, you know, a couple POWs come back together. You got, you know, William Devane's, um, um, sorry, let me do that again. Um, so a couple of POWs come back. You have William Devane's Major Charles Rain, Tommy Lee Jones, Johnny Voden, and they're, you know, riding in a plane together. They land and, you know, it's all fanfare, pomp and circumstance. You know, they're giving them um, awards and stuff because they've been POWs and they're being welcomed back home. And it's like this big show and display of all this gratitude and thanks for what you've done. But it just seems so fake <laughs> as you as you kind of get into it and you know um William Devane and Tommy Lee Jones are so stoic you know they're just it's just a matter of business like they it's like they appreciate it but they just are still in another world and yeah. um you know that's the big thing with them in this movie is like they're having it's about them trying to adjust back to normal life I mean it's like being let out of Shawshank but Shawshank also tortured you the whole time you're in it yeah. Um, so there, you know, it's going to be a huge adjustment, and um, it's like being on another planet. Yeah, and it's just one of those ones. that's just the whole thing. It's just like they almost just like, just let me uh, go be by myself, and you know, the only the only there's only one person that understands me, you know, and that's Tommy Lee Jones and William Devane. Those guys, you know, that that's it. They're the brothers, but in a sense. Nobody else will ever get it, you know. What I mean, they just think, well, yeah. they're just happy for them to be back, and you know, as they come back, even William Devane, he comes back, it's like, well, I guess we're gonna get back to the family, and you know, his kid was, you know, so young that he doesn't even remember his dad, so it's like there's there's a, such a disconnect there, you know. The wife's there, and then she does it kind of so like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm uh, getting a divorce, and I'm gonna, you know, marry the sheriff now. Hope you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and William Devane almost even has that like. Oh, guess that's what it is he well that would that whole scene when he gets back you know there's all the problems circumstance and then they go home and you know there are all these nice things happen you know they they welcome them home so warmly but when he gets to his real house he has the awkward conversation with this kid like the stepdad that just married into the family and yeah. even when he's picked up you know the cliff character you meet him for the first time he's a local law enforcement you know um person <laughs> And uh, he's even there going to help him take him home. The way he's talking to his kid, uh, William Devane's kid, and it calls him Runt. And yeah. it was just too familial. But they set that up right away so well. It was like, my that was, they're just too comfortable, you know? Yeah. So I knew something was going on even before they get to the house. And then this is the house. He has an awkward conversation with his kid. His wife's like, He's like, you're not wearing a brassiere. And she's like, yeah, we don't do that anymore. He's like, okay. And then he's like, oh, by the way, I've been fucking uh, the, <laughs> you know, the uh, local law enforcement officer because I thought you were dead. Yeah, I was like, I don't think you're coming back, you know. Yeah, but he did when say. That, that was two days after you got captured. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, he did say, she did say, though, that, um, I mean, he said that, well, we were told to expect that. Um. And which is just like, oh, God. So that that's the most heartbreaking, honestly, even with what's to come, the most heartbreaking moment of there, because you're just excited to get back to your family. And like you, you've lost them, too. And you didn't do anything wrong. Like you didn't you weren't absentee because of, you know, you were just, you know, a deadbeat asshole. You you know, you wanted to have a family, but you've lost them and you've missed them the whole time you've been gone. And now you're back. And it's like, eh, we don't want to be with you anymore. Like, God damn, that's just like. Yeah, see, the worst. you joined the Air Force, so you assumed that you weren't going to have this problem, but then you got <laughs> shot down, and then and then you got drug out to be a prison camp. <laughs> God, like, it's just so, but he takes it on the chin. Like, it's part of it's just like, you know, he expected it, but also part of it was like, you know, you really can't hurt me anymore. Like, he's kind of numb to, yeah. like, any type of um, anything. Like he yeah, li it, literally pain will not bother him whatsoever because that was what every single day was for the last seven yeah, years, physical, emotional, mental torture. And so, you know, it almost was probably somewhat welcomed because, you know, we see later on that he is having, not only having a trouble adjusting, but he misses, you know, you, you've been in the same routine and known to expect the same thing for seven years. Yeah. And you kind of miss it, I guess. Like, that's just, that's crazy. 
but it's like he, he starts <laughs> he, he puts his own room up as he has like the tool shed in like the backyard yeah or whatever he, and he pretty much makes his own like bunker there where he's got his own bed and he can do his calisthenics and so on like that and just is kind of out there on his own you know with a bunch of guns and so on like that mm-hmm yeah, he he is trying to reconnect with the son, but it's you know going slow, and um, you know he basically tells his wife that he just wants to be part of his son's life. He doesn't want to be you know lose that, which is yeah awesome. And so she has she demotes him to the shed, which I think part of, he partly wanted to sleep out there because it was just more, it was just easier transition, I guess. Yeah. Um, but there's that scene early in the movie where. Cliff comes out to his shed. He's like, hey, man, thanks for being really cool about me banging your wife while you're, you know, serving our country, you know, uh, prisoner of war. I really appreciate you just being so cool about it. And uh, he's like, yeah. And then as it, the conversation gets crazier, it, you know, he's like, hey, this is how they tortured me. And he's like, harder, harder. He's he's kind of down on his knees and he's making the Cliff character do all kinds of back. all back up and up. And yeah. Up. So you hear it crack, I think he says. Yeah. And you're like, oh, God, this is uh, this is, this is rough to watch. So, I mean, the movie's just gut punch after gut punch after gut punch after they get back from the fanfare from them arriving. It's just so much. And then they have another ceremony where he's given a Cadillac. And was it a Cadillac? I think yeah, it was. It was Cadillac. Yeah, it was yeah, Cadillac. Red, and then Red convertible Cadillac. Mm-hmm. Old red convertible Cadillac, and then uh, it was like two thousand five hundred and fifty some silver dollars for every year that he was. Um, uh, yeah, every, I mean, every day he was in captivity yeah. that year. Yeah, um, <laughs> so um, they give they gave him those, and um, you know that's kind of what sets up his uh, demise because Roscoe P. Coltrane is watching TV, and. Uh, says oh shit you know what we gotta do that son of a bitch that just uh served our country <laughs> got got uh you know went through pow camp and lost his wife and his kid to some asshole cop you know what we should do to him we should uh fuck him up and steal his money <laughs> so yeah. it's just like ah oh, this movie is just so depressing i will talk i'll talk about this later why this could not have been an 80s movie oh no no not not at all because they would have fucked been it up a- it would have been a much different thing. Um, oh my god! Yeah, yeah. it would have been like you know what it would have been like is a perfect example is a Rambo, Rambo One, because the book Rambo One is actually much more like Rolling Thunder and stuff like that, where it's a very mm-hmm. more darker, depressing, very seventies style. Rambo kills a lot of people in the book too, where he doesn't kill anybody in the movie, um, except for that one guy that sort of falls off the ledge. But that's more like a like a Batman one, where like, whoops, well, you know, I couldn't reach out close enough. I, I tried. Yeah. Yeah. But like in the book, like he kills people left and right because, and he literally, you know, dies at the end of it. Though ironically, there's still two books that come afterwards. <laughs> well, I was actually going to compare it to the difference between Rambo and Rambo Two because it's like a completely different character. Rambo, you know, in the first one, he kind of is a little bit of a pacifist. He doesn't want to fight anymore, and it's kind of forced to. He just wanted some food, and you know, like a warm place to sleep. But you know, Rambo Two is just you know total action and just you know carnage and just you know full on eighties action. Or, but like if if this were an eighties movie, they would have completely messed up what they do with the kids and the family and the whole end of the movie. But I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. But. um where she really hits the fan is he goes to a bar. He talks to this girl that is the girl that gave him the two to, to the silver dollars. Mm-hmm. She was the one who presented them at the ceremony. And she also wore this bracelet or something yeah. um, for him the whole time he was over in captivity. And she's got this huge, you know, daddy crush on him. And um, like wants him really, really bad. And it, which is convenient for him because, um, you know, his ex has him moving out. I just got divorced yesterday. Yeah, I just got divorced. So, it yeah, turns out the cop. <laughs> yeah, so um, it sounds like a Reba McIntyre song at this point. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so you know, he's flirting with this girl at the bar and then um, comes home. And um, there's some evildoers in this house. You've got Roscoe P. Coltrane and Automatic Slim and a bunch of people. They're going to... Uh, steal his money and he's not going to tell him where it is Mm -hmm. and in the middle of this uh his wife and kid walk in 
And his son, in an attempt to save him, says, tells them where the silver dollars are. And instead of just taking the money and leaving, they shove his hand down a fucking garbage disposal bowl, which I would love to see the original scene of that that everybody got freaked out about. Because yeah, apparently yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, apparently there's that, that's the thing. This is another one of those movies where it's like I I would love them to finally come out with like an extra director's cut or just extended cut because they did mention that in the special features that, that those scenes do exist. Yeah, they exist. They did test screenings and people were really messed up by it. They did not like what happened to his hand. I mean, they show it in the movie still and it's still bloody, but they, you don't see the actual hand. You don't see the actual aftermath of what they do, but they shove his hand in the garbage disposal. I mean, it's not yeah, pretty. Well, and they do in the movie. It's it's still affected the way it is in the movie. So it's not you know putting that. Down. Yes. It's just yes. You know, it's just like it's like just for like extended cuts and things like that. I would just love to see them do that because I feel like nowadays you could you could show that in like a special edition version and people would get it, and so on. But um, they do the thing where like it kind of cuts to like silence when his hands in there too. So it makes me wonder like what the version was where it was more very raw. You know, mm. wasn't that silent there? It was just literally just carnage and grinding. Yeah, probably like the scene in uh, Scarface with the chainsaw. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's yeah. I I would have liked to seen it because he he's so stoic when it happens. He takes it on the chin so well, and it's just like um, if you see that hand, how mangled it is, and you just see how he's just, you know, kind of cold to the fact that he you know and numb to it. Yeah. That would have been like crazy to see. But yeah, so they mangle his hand. And then what's worse is they kill his wife and his kid. Yeah. Well, the kid goes and grabs the coins right off the bat. They're yeah. like, oh, I know exactly where they are and so on like that. And you could tell that William Devane knows. He's like, the reason why he didn't get the coins up is he knew that the second that the coins are given up, they're going to have what they need. They're just going to kill us anyways. That, that was yeah. the whole thing. But the kid doesn't know that. He just goes for it thinking that this is going to save the day. And they follow through with it and be like, yep, we got what we needed. Boom, you guys are all dead. Yeah. Crazy. Just like, oh, my God, this film like, just gets worse and worse. I mean, and like, because you, you feel like he's going to have a relationship with this kid at least. He's at least going to have that. And then he's got the girl at the bar. So it's like, okay, you know, he's got the kid's got a stepmom. Um, you know, he's going to live his life. He could just be kind of be, you know, the really strong, silent type. And this girl's going to love him and who have his kid on the weekends. And Hey, everything's great, but yeah, you know, they fuck that all up too. Yeah. It just, it just, just destroys it all. And, that, and, then, and that's just what sets up, you know, this great kind of almost like revenge film going forth. You know, he's in the hospital now. He gets shot, and they think that he's left for dead, but he actually survives mm -hmm. because, you know, he's got that much determination going on. And when he's in the hospital, you know, the sheriff keeps coming by, the sheriff uh, as in the stepdad. Um, yeah. He's kind of like, well, what do you know? Tell me about it and stuff. And William Devane's just like, I, I can't remember. I, you know, blank out and all that stuff. And you can really just tell he's like, no, 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 because he wants to do it himself. Yeah. There's no way he's letting anybody else get in the way of this revenge. Well, you know, and the Cliff um, dude, the um, uh, step, what's funny is my stepdad's name, Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> so and I couldn't tell think of that in the whole movie, but he's very different. Um, but it's um, the, the step guy, Cliff, in this one is um, – you know, he has some skin in the game, too. He loved the wife and kid, yeah. even when he shouldn't have. And so, obviously, he wants his retribution, too. But he's not up, he's not up snuff like William Devane is. He's, I mean, William Devane's the hardest motherfucker there is now. Yeah. And, you know, um, th th he gets a hook for a hand because they mangled his hand all the pieces. And, um, you know, he, he's visited by Cliff. Cliff is trying to do his investigation. And while that's going on, Tommy Lee Jones is also coming to visit him. Yeah. And they're talking about how they're adjusting, which is not well. No, they, they, they just do not fit in whatsoever. You know, mm -hmm. and, and now is at the point where William Devane's got literally nothing to lose. He's nothing. Got one more mission, Lionel. Yeah, so he um, goes to the bar and absconds with the um, little bartender that's in love with him, the server. And uh, she doesn't know this, but he, she thinks we're going on holiday. She thinks, oh, we're just going to go down to Mexico, get drunk. You know, he's finally going to, you know, um, 
give me the D. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're just going to go have fun. Give her the Devain. Yeah, give her the Devain. <laughs> the Devaney vein. And, um, you know, it's going to be a happy, good time. But really, he's using her as bait. Yeah, because he doesn't give a fuck. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't care. He is very stone cold stoic, and very determined about what he's going to do. And he's going down to Mexico to um, fuck shit up, essentially. And that's basically what the rest of the movie is, without giving you every piece by piece point from that. But you have to kind of set up what is cause so much happens to his character. Mm-hmm. And you empathize with him so much without saying. So this movie actually reminded me of Mad Max. Yeah, a lot because you know Mel Gibson's a little, definitely has a little bit more charisma, a little more bubbly in Mad Max than William Devane is in this movie. But just you know, kind of um, the way it sets up for that brutal kind of ending. The kid gets killed, except that, you know, it happens later in the movie yeah. than it does earlier. I mean, it kind of, you know, it's kind of similar in a lot of ways. Well, and it's, that's the thing is the seventies just had so much of that, you know, life is gritty. It is dangerous. You know, things that, you know, don't happen happily. You know what I mean? It, like it has like that, just like hardcore feeling. There's still movies like these can, you know, they, they can always go so many different directions, really. You know what I mean? Because even in watching this movie, you kind of wonder, like, how is this ending going to kind of all go down? Because mm-hmm. in the 70s, there's so many ways to go about it. You know, a lot of times people go off the, the ultra-dark ending. But mm-hmm. ironically, I think Paul Schrader scripts, a lot of times, they always changed up. Even though the difference in, like, the Paul Schrader version, though, is, like, let's just say the William Devane character in that one is actually a racist guy. A yes. heavily racist guy. And he becomes way more racist. He's a Texas racist that becomes more racist when he goes to Vietnam from all the stuff that they did to him. So he ends up taking it out because all the bad guys, you know, are all Mexican. Where, like, in this movie, like, they, it's kind of funny because you don't think about it. It's like, oh, it's the 70s, but it's like, oh, no, no, no. They, they, they kind of pc did a little bit. They're like, no, no, that is too extreme. We need to pull that back a little bit here. Here we're going to do we're gonna make him a mixed race gang. <laughs> you yeah. Know? We're gonna, you know, put this in here and so on like this and tone it down, make William Devane a good guy, not a hateable guy. You know, and that's the same thing that was supposed to be even in uh, Taxi Driver. Because Taxi mm-hmm. Driver, you know, was supposed to be that Travis Bickle was actually a little bit more of a crazy racist kind of guy too. Not supposed to be as lovable, you know, as Robert De Niro and so on like that. And the whole thing is that all the bad guys at the end of Taxi Driver are supposed to all be black. You know, they weren't supposed to be you know, um, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Harvey Keitel and all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and granted, Paul Schrader, like, it was like, I feel like since you explained that, it makes it feel like, well, Paul Schrader was just right. He's like, no, oh, he had a message he was getting across here. Right. He, he was just doing it in a very hardcore way. I, I, I agree with Taryn. I like this version better. I yeah. wouldn't have wanted to see that because here's the thing with, with a situation like this, I don't need the movie to end well. I don't need it to have the happy ending. I'm fine with all the bad things happening to the character to give him motivation. I even thought he was going to die at the end of the movie. I was really yeah. shocked when he didn't. Um, so, yeah, so, it has a happy ending in a sense. Right, right. And I would have been fine with that if they told the story that way. But you still have to empathize with the character. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a struggle, too, when you bring the racism thing into it because it's it's hard to forgive it. That, that movie, we both love Hostels. Yes, Love that movie, but one, my problem with that movie was he was such a racist asshole, and then it just changed so abruptly in the movie. Yeah, like it was like, like when when did this change? Because it kind of felt like it was overnight. Like, well, I like Indians now, you know. Um, th- that would just been too much. You kind of sympathize with, you know, you know William Devane's character, and you do because he has done nothing wrong. He's a war hero, and all these bad things have happened to him since he got back. And it's mostly because of all the nice things that people were trying to do for him that, you know, mm-hmm. really don't matter at the end of the day. You know what I mean? It's just like pomp and circumstance. And it's like, look at us doing the nice thing for the you know Vietnam vet. But, you know, they're not really it's not really what he needs. You know what I mean? Exactly. No, no, no. I, I think that this is one of those perfect examples where it's like, as I said, it'd be interesting to read through the original draft. I have mm-hmm. that script there because Tarantino says he likes it like in a different way. He's like, both versions are great, but just in different ways. Yeah. But the way that this one rolls is just one of those ones like I, I feel like it's just 
all dialed in. Like, everything about it, the characters are right, everything there. I mean, I even just like, because once they start to go on that revenge spree and he starts searching around, like, there's so much great scenes there Mm -hmm. of him investigating some of those, like, bars down there in Mexico and so on like that. You know, an old fat Ed and all those characters down, just real creepsters and so on, Mm -hmm. you know. And even the poor girl getting kind of set up, but she still, like, plays a D. She's not just totally used, you know. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, there's so much there, and then to the point where he finally has to go get Tommy Lee Jones. I love that, like, there's that scene where it's Tommy Lee Jones' family that he's at the house, because he's just, mm-hmm. like, that's where he's living at, and he's, he is, like, in Houston or something like that, you know, so he's a few hours away. Um, but the thing is, is, I don't know what is that scene where they're just sitting around, the family's all talking there. I, that scene is just, I, I love the way that is, because you just see, like, the dead in Tommy's character. Yeah. It's just, like... Everybody there's in a sense having a good time, even though they're kind of bitching about like the turning of like of the American you know dream in a sense, I guess, over to like mm-hmm. you know foreign stuff, and how some people are like, well, I don't care, I'll buy a Japanese TV next time. Forget about it. At least it'll work. Yeah, yeah. They're just talking about normal everyday, you know, first world problems. Yeah, and it's just hard for them to relate. And you know, Tommy Lee Jones' wife, <laughs> smoke show. Yeah, and you know, it, he's got his pops there with him, which you can tell he reveres him. Yeah. And um, he's really nice to him. He even says goodbye to him when he's leaving because he's like, I don't know if I'm coming back. Yeah. But, um, I love how he says that just to Pops only. Yeah. yeah. Pops. <laughs> just like, Pops. And, and like Pops even like understands. So you can hear it in his voice. Like he gets it. Where everybody else is like, what are you doing? The mashed potatoes are getting cold. Are you leaving? Where are you going? You're like, they're so like clueless. Yeah. But Pops understood. Yeah. Pops want to be a WW2 vet. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, Pop's definitely understood. So, yeah, that scene was great. But when when they finally decide to go, he's like, I'm, I'm going to go down there and take care of these guys or tune them up or whatever he says. And Tommy Lee Jones says, I'll get my gear. I'm like, the best lines ever. It's so hard. So hard. I mean, it's just like, uh, it's right up there with, uh, I love you, I know. Like, <laughs> like Empire Strikes Back. It's just so, so good. Yeah, when I first heard that line, I was like, holy crap. That's like, it's one of those ones, the delivery on it, the line, it's just so straight to the point. Like, literally one of the coolest movie lines I think I've ever heard. And it's just, it, it describes everything. Like, mm-hmm. that right there is the best of friend that anybody can have, is Tommy Lee Jones. Like, that is the guy that will go down to hell and fight the devil with you because he got your back. Yeah. Well, I think they also need it. I think because they just, you know, they were being tortured for years. People, you know, killing your pride, killing your, you know, confidence, killing, you know, your soul, like just, just, you know, destroying everything that's human about you. And now these people are taking something from you again and just like, you know what? I don't have to take it anymore. (laughs) They they literally got nothing to lose. That's, That's the thing. They're at that point, like, you know, if anything, this would be a good death, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, and I think they plan on that, you know? And that's what I thought was going to happen. I thought I was going to get, you know, 1977's version of the Gladiator. You know, Gladiator gets revenge, you know, Russell Crowe comes and, you know, fucks shit up. And then at the end, dies, goes to Elysium, sees his wife and kid. I thought he was going to get that thing, which was interesting that they didn't go that route. I was totally expecting it, but I'm kind of glad they didn't. It's what's we, it's weird. It's like the seventies, you know, gives you the sad ending. Mm-hmm. And what's weird about this movie is that the happy ending is almost a sad ending <laughs> yeah. because it's like you were expecting him to die and like he has earned it. And then he does it. And you're like, Oh, this is kind of interesting. Where's his life going to go after this? Yeah, exactly. What's Rolling Thunder 2? <laughs> yeah. It's not a Rolling Thunder 2, is there? No. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was going to say, I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> if he's such a weird one to have a sequel to. Yeah. But it, it actually, I, I I love the super happy ending that it has for this. Well, I don't know if it's a super happy ending, but... It kind of is and isn't. You know, just the buddies, they make it out. Everybody who, like, did wrong is killed. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's glory at the end of the day. Even if those guys never, you know, whatever they go from this point on, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In a sense, I almost don't even picture those two actually even returning. Because even 
the poor sheriff guy even doesn't make it back from this because he's doing it like a he's like a got a B story going on here where he's yeah. investigating what the hell uh, William Devane's doing, but in the process he ends up getting killed. Yeah, this um, there was a lot of things that happened in Mexico. You know, he takes a little the girl with him, and she thinks she's on holiday until she realizes she's kind of bait, and she's there to help him seek revenge and. You know, she threatens to call the cops at one point. You know, they have their little lover squirrel, but they're also, you know, going back to the hotel room and, you know, getting it on. And so she's getting all the things that she wants. He's getting all the things that he wants. A really good quid pro quo, um, you know, love story. Like, hey, you help me kill these people. And uh, I'll let you hold one of them silver dollars when I get them back. <laughs> you know, that kind of yeah. thing. But, I mean, I have mixed feelings about the girl being there. It's like... Part of me wanted them, that character to go away and then just have Tommy Lee Jones the whole whole way through, but then it wouldn't have had the payoff at the end when you he does go get Tommy Lee Jones. It wouldn't have it wouldn't have worked as well. Yeah, well, yeah. Because I think is you just kind of like it'd be nice to see Tommy in the more of the movie, right? But at the same time, it's one of those ones that like yeah, when when Tommy gets there, it's like that makes that so much stronger. Yeah, you know, and just as they go in, they, they you know he's got it all planned out and whatnot like that. Tommy's gonna go in there get a hooker, you know. But you could just tell he's like he's in there. He's just waiting for that moment when they're just gonna get their guns and just start shooting the place up. The way he's just so doesn't care about that hooker. No, <laughs> like, she's so frustrated. <laughs> you know. Tommy Lee Jones is okay looking dude back then. He's in tall drink of water, you know. Yeah. He's he's not the uh the same guy from the fugitive. He kind of aged like Bill Murray. So Yeah, well the thing too is Tommy Lee Jones, I feel like he's the guy who kind of got famous when he was older. You know, he was he was in movies, but he was kind of like either side characters or like they weren't you know, as you know, maybe the movie might be kind of big, but once again, you know, maybe his role wasn't as much, you know, until like Fugitive and onwards. Yeah. Fugitive was definitely the next big. I mean, he was in Coal Miner's Daughter and other stuff, too. He was a well respected yeah, actor. Yeah, he's, he, well, he's, even, he's one of the best characters he's ever done, is the the one that uh, in uh, um, Under Siege, where he's pretty much playing like Keith Richards. <laughs> I don't even remember that. Yeah, I don't know if like, I have I seen that. So under... chewing scenery in that movie. He literally is playing like a Keith Richards villain. We got to watch mm. that movie, dude. Both the Under Siege and Under Siege 2. Like that, Steven Seagal is like pinnacle. <laughs> uh, that's it. Yeah, that's got to be because, yeah. But um, I'll give it a try. I mean, I, Tommy Lee Jones is in something. I'm gonna give it a try. I mean, it's just how it is. Lee Jones is the bad guy in it, dude. It's so yeah. Good. God, I fucking love Tommy. Tommy Lee Jones is so awesome. He really is one of my favorite actors ever. Um, I feel like I've heard somewhere. I'm gonna look this up while, while we continue because I feel like he was roommates with Bill Clinton at one point in time. Back in the day, huh. um, oh, I'll just look that up real quick. Yeah, th th that's one that needs to be answered because that's an interesting one there. <laughs> See if that is true and whatnot. But yeah, Tommy's what's one of those guys? It's like so many. Oh, guys. Al Gore. It was Al Gore. It was Al Gore. Oh, that's even more. That's still interesting in itself. Yeah, Tommy Lee Jones and Al Gore were roommates for four years. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I guess uh, Harvard. I think he went to Harvard. Huh. Yeah, Harvard University, class of '69. Four years, him and Al Gore. You got Tommy Lee Jones, who was like a has charisma, but is also a black hole of charisma, and then Al Gore, who tries to have charisma and doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. It's, what a interesting pair. That would be a weird room to be in. Yeah. That would be a real law box, you know? Yeah. He's like, I don't Mike care. Pig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just, oh my gosh, that'd be a weird. Al Gore's always that guy who wants to try to get everybody to rally on his side, and everyone's like, no, no. I wonder what Tipper Gore thought of Rolling Thunder. Yeah, that's exactly. exactly. Gosh. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Miss, miss, uh, you know, music writings. I bet she hated Rolling Thunder, but yeah, and Al Gore's on every like hateful council, and that be video games and movies and heavy metal and so yeah, on. damn. D. Yeah. Snyder like literally like showed up Al Gore like in like whatever when they had those like you know uh, parental advisory hearings. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, old Tipper, old Tipper Gore. Um. So yeah, Rolling Thunder. Yeah. So th basically, the whole movie is building up to this scene where they go to Mexico and 
they have to find out where everybody is. They have to go through all these channels. They have to, he has used the girl as bait to get back in the room to talk about, um, you know, where, you know, big, I think it's big Ed they're looking for. Yeah. Fat and Ed. yeah, fat Ed. And he, you know, hooks a guy in the nuts, which is amazing. <laughs> a very, you can see why Tar- Tar- that stuck with Tarantino. That almost yeah. informed his version of violence. Like if I could, if I've ever seen something that said, okay, where did Tarantino's version of violence, his idea of what it is come from? It's that. Yeah. Like I was like, okay, you're going to hook a guy in the nuts. I mean, come on. Um, so yeah, you have some action scenes in there kind of spread out, but it's very, it, I like the pacing in this. I think the pacing is great. I, I yeah. one of those ones like, you know, it, it's that one that some people might see it as a little bit slow if you're not used to 70s movies, but like there's no boring scenes in it. Everything's yeah. great about it. Like you're just interested I agree. to see what happens next. It's it's intentionally slow, but it's making everything everything has more weight. They're building more weight to everything. The only thing that doesn't get your and you get the payoff. The only thing that doesn't get the payoff is the love story. It's a very abrupt end. And there is some editing, some weird editing in here, but the pacing is good. I liked it. And it's just, yeah. you know, this is how 70s movies were. Like you're gonna you're gonna build the characters, build the story to a crescendo, and you're gonna get your you know, grand finale. And it's like people forget the other act there are other action scenes in this. Yeah, there, it's there, just, there's quite a know, bit of them actually. They're yeah. shorter, but they're you know, they're but there is probably at least ten action scenes probably throughout the entire movie. Yeah, and yeah. And then, you know, because everybody's focused on that final one because it's they build it up to such a, a moment, you know, and everything they, that happens up to that point from the time they get the kid, the kid and the wife dies to, you know, the actual, you know, event, the final scene, everything's building up to that moment. So even those other action scenes are adding weight to it. But my God, that last scene is, is fucking good. It's like, it's so it did not feel like a seventies scene. Cause the eighties are great. I love the eighties. They do certain things better mm-hmm. than the seventies. This could not have been an eighties movie, but the action scene at the end did feel to me a little bit more like the way it was shot and everything felt a little bit more like an eighties action scene. Well, the nice um, thing about seventies, the seventies mostly has a little bit more brutality than the eighties do. That, a little that's bit. The, that's the difference. I feel like the eighties has a little bit more spectacle. That's the trade off is the brutality's yeah. less, but the spectacles turned up higher. The explosions are bigger. Mm-hmm. The, you know, like maybe some of the, just even like the things like the drops, the buildings, you know, whatever, like the background stuff, you know, larger locations and so on. But mm-hmm. in seventies, you just get that just, Brutal violence, you know, just gets right to the point, just carnage. Yep. And the fact that I love it, it's got the classic, mm. what I always call it the 70s ending, where bad guys are dead, boom, cut the credits. Yeah. There's no more movie left to be shown. Like, I love yeah. that so much. No, like, it's not like 2000s movies where, like, they got six different endings that keep rolling each time. Yeah. And the movie's clearly been over for the last 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And there's this movie, you know, gets makes its point and then it goes away. But I and listen, I love 80s movies. The, you, like you said, yeah. the spectacles a little bit more, the, the special effects, just the, the cinematic magic is a little bit more in the 80s. And that's why I love 80s movies. But I mean, and I like the optimism, but the optimism of the 80s movies doesn't work as well without the, you know, if you grew up watching 70s movies, you expect there could be a bad ending because you got them. Yeah. You know, and it was more prevalent. And um, if they would have made this movie in the 80s, if they would have made Rolling Thunder in the 80s, the kid, the mom and kid would not have been killed. They would have been no. kidnapped. Yeah. The Cliff character would have either had a chance to save them and chickened out, and he's a bitch, and so William Devane's character's got to show him up, or he would have had something to do with it, or, or maybe a little bit of both. Yeah, or he has to sacrifice himself. Or he would be yeah. the character that dies. Because... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but he, he has to go out like a bitch, though, because yeah. that's going to set up. So this is the 80s version. So, yeah, they get kidnapped, and he's got to go um, down to Mexico and kill everybody. And in the mean, me- meantime, you have, you know, the almost sex scene with the girl, but he's like, no, I'm going to get my wife and kid back. Goes down there huge action scene the wife and kid comes yeah and now the kid's got his dad's respect 
It'll be your explosions. Now the kid's like, I, I'm so glad you're my father now. I'm sorry, I, you know, it's awkward because I haven't seen you in seven years, but now we can be father and son and everything's happy ending and blah, blah, blah. That's how the 80s version would have went. Yeah, and w- William Devane's played by Chuck Norris. Yeah, oh, it would have been, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, it almost feels like it's in that kind of style. Or like a, or like a, um, or they would have went somewhere like a Michael Bean or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get somebody like that. Um, yeah, no, it's amazing just the, just that shift. And perfect examples, as we brought up earlier, it's the first blood one because if you ever get a chance, read that first blood book, and it's it, you know it's the same core story, but it's just the tonality is so much different, mm. you know, and just the extra like it, it's just so seventies. Yeah, you know, first blood so seventies, and then like the movie in a sense is proto eighties when it, by the time it comes out because it's been yeah. that long. I mean, I mean, it is 81, but I mean, it, it starts that 80 style, even though I know that like, yeah, Rambo 2 takes it even farther. But like even Rambo, even First Blood, just compared to the book is such a completely polar opposite like vision. Yeah. And you can say that about this one, too. Like um, Paul Schrader says, like it was an anti-fascist film and they made it a fascist film, which I don't see how this is a fascist film at all. Yeah, I'm well, sorry. Yeah. Like it I, just, think, I, I think Paul Schrader has I think he's got some of those like. um Almost kind of like the same way as like John Milius does, where they got like those like sounds weird. Like they're they're very like hippie conservatism like views, like in a weird way. Yeah, bohemian. Yeah, conservatism. Yeah, because that's how I feel like John Milius. He's like he's one of those guys. Like he makes Red Dawn, where somebody's like that's the most conservative film ever. But it's like he's also like one of the hardest like hippie guys too at the same time. So yeah. I don't know. You know what I mean? He he's just like he's a hippie that just loves America, and you know Conan yeah. the Barbarian and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, look, I love John Millius. We, can, I, I don't God. care. Like, it, it, John Millius is—he's kind of like Paul Schrader. Where it's like whenever they have movies, I'm very interested in seeing what it is. Like, you know, you're going to get something cool. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And this movie is really, really good. I, I don't have a problem with you know the fact that they changed. it. I think they made the right decision. I think it's that makes for a better movie. Yeah, you know, and you don't want to see like. It's just impossible in the in the climate of today, especially the reason you couldn't make this movie. And I don't I don't like to talk about woke cancel shit. I don't like it, but because people are canceled when they have even the slightly most racist thing to say. Yeah. If if you made this movie in the original style today, like you, they wouldn't even release it because it was like no, you gotta you can't you can't make them that much racist because then you know nuance doesn't exist and people will never like you know forgive them yeah and um, the funny thing is even back in the 70s that was the, that was the thing the studio was like whoa, whoa 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 pump the brakes on that there they were already questioning it they're like this ain't gonna sell now yeah yeah and it, i think the the downfall to that is it's it's you know there's messages about vietnam and what happens to these soldiers and you know how they're you know it's kind of a two-faced you know, welcome home where you're getting all this pomp and circumstance, but nobody really cares. Nobody wants to help you with the things that actually matter. Mm-hmm. And so you, there are messages in there. I don't feel like it ever really completely gets to them. They're kind of like floating in the ether, but some of the messages hit home completely. Um, but this is a damn, damn good movie. This is uh, up in the higher echelon of anything that we've ever reviewed. Um, yeah. We're almost just, just not worthy to review it. In a way, <laughs> yeah, it's so good. It's one of those movies that's just like every time I watch it, it's just, as I said, it puts a smile on my face just because it's how good. And I know it's one of those, you know, most people might go like, well, that's a strange one to kind of, you know, a darker movie like this, but I don't know. It's like, it's a hundred percent right up my alley. Everything I like about it, as I said, once again, it's Paul Schrader, like, especially in the 70s, like, even if it's like one of those, even the script might get like altered, it's like, still, he creates these great core concepts that go with it, just like Taxi Driver, just like Raging Bull, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, there's just so many of these films. Yeah, this is, this is a really, really good one. This is, um, you know, William Devane is amazing in it. His, he's just he's stoic but you're empathetic with the character anyway you know they they put him in he's the ultimate hero because they've taken everything away from him yeah i mean they took seven years of his life they tortured him they've taken away his wife and kids now you know they've taken away his hand and mangled it so like he not only does he have nothing to lose but he's the perfect redemption art character because he didn't deserve anything to happen to him yeah um this movie is so damn good. I mean, it really, really is. I, I would have, um, I would like to see some of the stuff that was cut out of it too. 
yeah. you know, some of the carnage and stuff. I think it was, I think it's actually one of the rare movies where that gratuitous carnage would actually improve it. Yeah. But um, no, I, I think that would, yeah. there, there would be some interesting stuff there. As I said, it's, it's like one of those many ones. It'd be neat to see more things kind of extended out. You know, when, when you know that these scenes actually do exist somewhere, it's mm-hmm. always a bummer that like people just like lock them away, or if they, you know, hopefully still exist in good condition. Yeah, they might not. You know, but Rolling Thunder, nineteen seventy-seven. It is um, not the easiest watch, but it is enthralling. It is good. If you like a slow burn, if you like revenge flicks, if you like um, movies that, you know, have that 70s feel to them, um, slightly grindhouse to a small extent, um, but definitely more restrained version of what that is. I couldn't recommend this movie more than more than I can. I mean, it, it, this is a must see. I, I think if you really, really love movies, especially 70s movies, this is a must see. Oh, yeah. I, I think this is like one of those ones. I've only just, in a sense, recently seen it, but I think it's like one of the top tier 70s films around. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the acting is solid in it. A lot of things that struggle with 70s movies isn't there. I mean, it, they take their time with it. They build a correct, real scene with real tension. It's a well-directed movie. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a must see. Did, we, did you watch Well, I mean, I guess you watched your Blu-ray. I think I watched it on Amazon. I think it's on Amazon right Yeah, now. it's on Amazon. I actually watched it on there for like just because I could watch it on the go. Oh, yeah. For, for my last watching of it. But, um, but yeah, I, as I said, I got it on Blu-ray because it wasn't on Amazon for a long while. And so I was like, I'm just that. And plus, the Blu-ray's got some kind of cool special features on there, too. And, you know, nothing ridiculous. But I think there's like a 25-minute uh, documentary on there, which is just pretty neat. Damn, yeah, I would like to see that. But um, yeah, you could watch Rolling Thunder on Prime right now. If you if you love Tarantino, uh, if you yeah. want to see the movies that inspired him, there's a reason to watch that. If you love 70s movies, um, if you like watching underrated gems, if you like watching a, a cult classics, this movie fits all those descriptions. So, um, you know, you this is see Tommy like, Lee Jones young. Yeah, if you want to see Tommy Lee Jones very young, you know, this is the equivalent of Bill Murray and Caddyshack. Okay. Yeah. Like, because they both aged, um, horribly, I was probably having to spend four years without gore and one, you know, sharing in the same room that would, yeah. that would, that would, uh, definitely age me a little bit. Well, ironically is if the fact that this is like almost like 10 years past when they're in college, so that means that yeah. like, uh, Tommy Lee Jones is still probably like late twenties on this. So he's not like super young yet, but this is as young as you've ever seen him almost. Yeah, that's definitely damn true. <laughs> but yeah, if you're a Tommy Lee Jones fan, this is another one worth watching. So, um, yeah, Rolling Thunder, great one, one of the best we've ever done. Um, watch it on Amazon Prime. Anything uh, before we get out of here? Any last comments? Anything you want to say? No, I think that about kind of covers it. It's just one of those films that, like, yeah, if you haven't got out of the way to see it yet, I mean, granted, both me and you got around kind of late to it anyways. It's I yeah. feel so many other people kind of have, too. It's just one of those ones, you know, definitely go out and check this film. If there's any film out of the ones we've done the last, like, 100 episodes or whatever, this is one to be. Yeah, this is definitely one of the must-sees. So um, go to Amazon, watch, you know, Rolling Thunder or buy the Blu-ray or the, you know, for whatever is out there. You just just watch it. Find a way to watch it. Yeah. Um, and uh, let us know what you think about it. Um, you, as always, you can go to um, Via VHS. And I have something to share here in just a second. You always go to add Via VHS on X if it still exists in the future. Like, there's just so much turmoil with these social media sites. I, I, I mean, like, X is fighting with Nintendo and xbox and now like apple and um all that stuff's going on and i don't know if tiktok's gonna exist in the near future so you know maybe 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 i have to start paying attention to myspace and instagram yeah <laughs> maybe that's you what i have to know, yeah um but you know you can check us on all of these places you can always go to oldmanorange.com find all things that spencer does his old man orange um a podcast the pizza boys comic and all kinds of other all kinds of other stuff. Um, I'm pausing. Okay. So for just um, a split. So, well, shit. What the hell? Let me see. I'm trying to find something. Hmm. Hmm. 
I like songs. Your episodes. Hold on a second. I just saw them. Oh, here it is. All right. Also, if you want to listen to this via VHS Beats thing I was talking about earlier, that's what it's called. Um, maybe I'll put the logo over here somewhere and you can see what I'm talking about. Via VHS Rewind and Review Soundtrack Hits. The playlist is called Via VHS Beats. And I've got stuff from Fern Gully, Days of Thunder, Light of Day. I got Wild Wild West, um, The Weird Owl, George of the Jungle. Ooh. Yeah, I, I got a few songs from Surf Ninjas, and of course, I'm always here from uh, from Baywatch. Oh yeah, gotta gotta mm. have that. I'll be ready, and I guess I'll be adding you, you San Antonio. Throw, you gotta throw a Hogan's theme on there too, just for if you, you know. I couldn't. It, it, there was all kinds of issues with it. Um. Well, there's a good cover of Hogan's theme um, that I could, that I know is on there. <laughs> mm. Is it the uh, the WCW version or the WWE version? It actually, be like the WWF version, technically. Yeah. See, I wanted to try to find there was a song in the Baywatch episode. Yeah, the, the one with, when they're all running and everything. Like well, they, yeah, they do the montage. I was trying to find that song to throw in there, and I couldn't find it. Yeah. Um, but I, I really wanted that one. Um, That's probably a Jimmy Hart song, but. Um. <clears throat> anyway, thank you all for listening to the show. Go to you know any of those social media sites if they still exist. If you want to argue with us about it, give us, give your thoughts on Rolling Thunder. Um. But uh, anyway, um, maybe some more lighthearted stuff coming next week. We'll see what's going on. But I know it's going to be a great episode. We're going to have fun watching whatever we do. So thank you all for listening. Come back and see us again next week. And Via VHS is out. <laughs>